Greetings, YouTubers. Welcome to episode one of the Backpacker Fact Checker. There are certain ideas about backpacking that get circulated throughout the internet until they seem to be generally accepted as facts without ever actually being proven. So the concept for this series is to track down some of those ideas, one topic at a time, and see if we can discover exactly where it is they come from. And then maybe you can make a judgment about the truthfulness and or usefulness of the supposed information. For my inaugural investigation, I chose the topic of shoe weight. Now, spend any time researching off-road footwear and you're likely to see the rule one pound on your feet equals five pounds on your back. The underlying theory is simple. Shoes are effectively weights at the end of pendulums you call legs. And the pound in your pack just moves along with nearly the constant speed of your body. But in order to take steps, your feet have to accelerate twice that speed before then having to be stopped and accelerate all over again. It's all this starting and stopping that makes weight on your feet more costly to carry than that same amount in your pack. Now this five to one ratio is usually presented without a source, and when it is referenced, it's always with a study conducted by the US Army Research Institute. Well, here is that study. It's from 1983, entitled The Energy Cost and Heart Rate Response of Trained and Untrained Subjects Walking and Running in Shoes and Boots. So the first thing to note is that the famous 5 to 1 ratio is not actually from this study. It's mentioned during a background discussion of other research in the area. The 5 times actually comes from a 1969 study by Sol and Goldman. So one of the things that piqued my interest was the Army author's conclusion that no studies have examined the energy cost of wearing different weights of footwear over a wide range of locomotive speeds. What if the weight penalty of heavier footwear is speed dependent? And then it might not actually be five to one for both walking and running. So I started digging my next rabbit hole. Now statements like this have to be read carefully. The energy cost is significantly increased by boots at speeds above four kilometers per hour. And again, VO2 data demonstrated that the energy cost of wearing boots was significantly greater at all treadmill speeds except the slowest walking speed 4 km per hour. So first consider use of the word significantly. To us that means great or important, so this sentence might as well read that the energy cost of wearing boots was much greater. But you see this p-value here? That's a statistical confidence level. To these scientists, the word significantly is a term of art. Its meaning to them is much more specific and limited than the common definition of the word. Statistical significance just means that a given result is unlikely to be explained solely by chance or random factors. And used in this way, the term significance does not imply importance, and it's not the same as saying the result itself has some sort of theoretical or practical significance. It's only a mathematical test indicating the probability that a given data set is showing a genuine signal rather than just being noise. Now, I'm belaboring the point on purpose. Part of what I hope to accomplish with this series is a foundation for knowing when to ask deeper questions and how to interpret the science speak that inevitably fills the studies you will come across when doing so. Okay, going back to the results quote, Wearing boots was found to have an energy cost that was statistically identifiable at all speeds except four kilometers per hour. So let's go to table two for details. In this study, the proxy they use for energy expenditure is the VO2 of subjects performing on a treadmill, where VO2 is a measure of their oxygen uptake. The delta VO2 is the increase in oxygen uptake when subjects put boots on instead of shoes for each of the given speeds. And as you can see, regardless of the speed used, there was some level of energy penalty for wearing heavier boots over a lighter pair of shoes. Note, however, that the amount of that penalty is markedly different depending on how fast your feet are moving. Now, I always prefer to see it rather than just read it, so I put these numbers into a graph. If you are running, swapping your sneakers for boots increases your oxygen uptake by three or more. The switch gates, however, and even at the fastest walking speed, gives only about half the change. And by walking at four kilometers per hour, you reduce the energy penalty of wearing boots to a fifth or less what it would be if you were running. And for our purposes, the question becomes which one of these walking speeds best represents that of hiking. When 1892, a Scottish mountaineer came up with Naismith's rule. 
He assumed a base speed of three miles per hour, plus an additional hour for every 2,000 feet of ascent. Aitken later suggested that three miles per hour was really only for flat paths and roads, offering two and a half miles per hour as a more practical estimate on all of the surfaces, which would apply to much of what hiking is. The interweb consensus also appears to be that two and a half miles per hour is a reasonable average for what a fit adult hiker can maintain on trail. And for what it's worth, my own experience leads me to agree. Three miles per hour is a fairly brisk walking pace, and I can sustain that on relatively smooth and level ground, but things like rocky or muddy paths, hills, and obstacles will start to slow me down. So I'll proceed with two and a half miles per hour as the average speed of hiking. So going back to our graph, where does that fit? Right here, four kilometers per hour is two and a half miles per hour. So none of the most dramatic declarations about the energy cost of wearing boots have any realistic relevance to the average backpacker because they apply to running, not walking. A hiker suffers less than a fifth of the boot penalty that the average trail runner experiences. And if you're wondering why this column is in gray, it's not because this is the speed of hiking. It goes back to the concept of statistical significance and the data in table two. And at the bottom, we have p-values for the level of statistical significance for each data set. And note the p-value at our hiking speed of four kilometers per hour. The NS stands for not significant. So this is what the authors meant when they kept referring to the significance of the results for all speeds except four kilometers per hour. You see, in any given experiment, there are multiple trials creating data sets as opposed to the singular values you see averaged in tables. And there are natural variations, not just between the human subjects, but between one subject's performance on different days. And some of those variations will be due to differences in circumstances that the researchers are not able to identify or account for. And they create a form of background noise for the signal that an experiment is trying to detect. So is an increase from one trial to the next due to the proposed effect being studied, or is it just the randomness of a human being's imprecise performance? If subject A didn't sleep as well between trials, their results might differ due to that, rather than the changes that researchers had hoped to isolate for their tests. Statistical significance is a mathematical way to express the probability that results are real and not random. Here they used an industry standard p-value of 0.05, which translates to a 95% confidence that a genuine effect was observed. But at 4 kilometers per hour, the results did not meet this criterion for statistical significance. So what's happening is the effect in question has shrunken to the point where it's increasingly likely to be confused with some other random variation. And that's not really what we're led to believe by the blanket assertion that one pound on your feet equals five pounds in your pack. So I found another study corroborating the idea that speed matters when considering the energy penalty of moving with weighted feet. Physiological strain due to load carrying in heavy footwear, published in 1992 in the European Journal of Applied Physiology. And this study used both male and female subjects walking at three speeds, while either barefooted, in combat boots, or with a waist pack. In doing a sort of meta-review of existing studies, the authors note, the results from experiments reported in the literature would indicate that walking velocity affects dramatically the VO2 per kilogram shoe mass, by a factor of five, by the way, when going from hiking speed to running. And they even plotted the results from the surveyed studies to create a graph with trend line. And here, VO2 per kilogram is a derived formula for how much additional energy must be spent for each increment of shoe weight. And again, visually you can see how much less the same amount of extra weight matters at lower speeds. So how does all of this compare to our original claim of one pound on the feet equals five pounds in the pack? Instead of such a fixed ratio, the authors calculated a range of ratios from 1.9 to 4.7. So under the fastest circumstances, they had close to the five to one commonly repeated. But at the slow end, the speed of hiking, the ratio drops to less than two to one. So regarding the assertion that a pound on your feet costs you as much energy as carrying five pounds in your pack, in the specific context of backpacking, I would rate that claim as false. 
with the error being that the exaggerated ratio for flat out running is being misapplied to the much slower pace of actual hiking. So instead of five to one, it's likely less than half that, with one study finding that the effect becomes so small it loses statistical significance. But wait, it's not the end of the story. The military study took things one step further. You see, after conducting trials for both athletic shoes and leather military boots, they did one more round of tests. This time the subjects wore the lighter athletic shoes, but with bags of lead pellets strapped to their sides. And this made the more flexible shoes the same weight as the stiffer boots. And what they found was very interesting. It turns out that on average, weight alone could account for only about 60% of the energy penalty for wearing boots. So even if assuming the weight part of the penalty ranged from 65 to 70%, that still leaves 30 to 35% of the increased energy cost unexplained. So basically, about a third of the famous boot energy penalty isn't actually due to them being heavier. The authors theorized some of this unexplained portion of the energy cost of wearing boots may be due to biomechanical limitations such as stiff soles and restrictive uppers. In other words, some of the work spent walking in a stiff pair of boots is used to flex them. That extra work equates to energy lost and is irrespective of their weight. To get the results in the military study, they had to compare feathery athletic shoes to leather combat boots. Well, even my pair of waterproof Columbia titaniums are 460 grams lighter than that. And combat boots aren't just heavy. Remember that a third of their energy cost came from having to bend all those stiff materials. Well, something like these ultra lone peaks are essentially just sneakers with a mid top. And the difference between these and their low top versions is less than 100 grams for the pair. Or if you had some Innovate rock lights, the difference between these and a pair of lone peaks plus gaiters is a mere 20 grams or 10 grams per shoe. So the military study might be relevant to soldiers, but it represents a false dichotomy to the hiker. As both the weight and flexibility of modern footwear has improved, the difference between low and mid top options has decreased. And so also must the energy penalty shrink. In some cases to the point where it may no longer be detectable. So the next time somebody says that a pound on your feet is worth five on your back, you can tell them that's only if you're running in leather combat boots. It doesn't apply to hiking in modern ultralight footwear. In epilogue, there's a sort of amusing way you could reframe this entire discussion from one of weight to that of speed. From Fletcher and Rollins' The Complete Walker 4th Edition, page 194, comes this table of the energy cost of activities. Look how going just one mile per hour faster literally doubles the calorie cost of walking. A 50% increase in speed results in a 100% increase in energy. Now I'll go back to the graph showing the energy penalty of wearing boots instead of shoes. And here again, just one mile per hour increase in walking speed doubles the effect. And it's sort of an apples to oranges comparison, but an interesting coincidence. One could argue that it's actually the rate at which you swing your legs that matters more than the shoes you put on your feet. I'm just gonna stir that pot and leave it right there. And just real quick before I go, I did find a few other studies in this area. The Army study looked only at men. Well, a few years later, those same authors went back and did similar tests with women, getting similar results. And this study wanted to see what happens with hikers in heavy boots who are also carrying a heavy backpack. And they did find that it was 6.4 times more expensive to carry weight on the feet as compared to the back, but I have a couple issues with their methodology. First, they tested walkers at only one speed. More importantly, look at the weights involved. And they used boots that were 5% of body weight and a pack that was 35%. One about six foot one and just over 200 pounds. And for me, that would mean increasing my boot weight by more than 10 pounds. With what, concrete sneakers? And then lastly, a study of walking in the snow with different weight boots found no significant differences. Now they let participants choose their own speed, however, and their metric was perceived exertion, not actual energy expenditure. Okay, folks, that's all I've got for this one. Hopefully you found it useful. 
there's lots of potential topics to cover and it gives me something I can put out between larger projects like waiting for cooler weather so I can start testing windscreens in part three of my backpacking stove efficiency series. As always, I very much appreciate your time and thanks for watching.